there we go. That's the next shear line that's in the next chamber, and I've slid it in a little bit further. I'll keep doing this with the line so you can actually get a, a good visual. Hey everyone, this is a curiosity. It's something that we can all explore together. So Red Team Tools had a customer and they bought a pack of locks from us. It's our progressive set, the same exact set that we've been using in Red Team Alliance classes for a while. I've designed this kit to be you know, increasingly difficult uh, to learn. It's the, the first lock has one pin, the second lock has two, but then it gets not just increasing number of pins, we added some security pins and even for impressioning, the progressive set, I use nickel silver coated pins, so they're, they're hardened and they'll make better marks on keys for the initial locks. And then the higher numbers, uh, they have brass, so you know, you gotta be really careful seeing those impressioning marks. There's even some mastering elements in some of these that we start incorporating into the class, discovering the top master key. But what surprised me was when a person said, hey, I got my order and the locks are all wrong. And I said, oh, that's weird. I mean, Kaba, Kaba has problems in that they're slow. They, they take a long time to make the stuff they send us, but they've never sent us, you know, like a freaking fruit slicer instead of a lock. I'm like, what, what's wrong about them? They're locks, right? They said, yeah, well, they're missing all the pins. And I said, go on. And they said, well, all the locks only have a single pin in them. And I said, I've never, ever heard that. But do tell me more. Did you actually check them? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I return them or get replacements? I said, oh, you know, you send them to me. I want to know what happened and we'll send you replacements. And I got a box that I opened up and it look, I think this customer only checked the first lock because the others didn't even look ripped like out of their bags. I think they saw the first lock, didn't understand how the progressive system worked. And I even emailed them. I was like, just to head off your disappointment, you're gonna get the same thing you just got because these look fine. And you know, I kind of looked down into the lock with some light behind them and you can kind of see, all right, we got more pins in here. And if you ever do the thing with a diamond, you know, you half diamond, you lift it up, you get snap, 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 snap. You can hear the pins dropping off. And I'm like, look, these, these all seem really populated. But just for the sake of this video, let's do an actual forensic dissection of a lock. And some people had mentioned recently, in fact, it was neat, uh, the, the lock sports guest Charles had mentioned that our evidence stickers and other things were showing, you know, he's like, oh, they got new stuff at the site. I was like, that's kind of cool. Mo forensics teams use these. We don't, you know, tend to use them in class. Uh, I, I will run a forensics class and a tamper class one of these days, I promise. But if anyone's curious about how, you know, lock forensics actually works in, you know, in practice, I figured it might be fun to do an actual forensic deconstruction of, of a lock, and you can understand how all this is done. And one of the things you'll note is that uh, anything in front of me right now, it's all plastic at the moment. Because, and this is a, this is a thing we've learned in, in forensics training, Tom DeMott was like, you know, if you submit evidence photos, if your workbench, you know, you've got your, your rulers and such, and everything's there, and you oh look, I'm so super technical, blah, blah, blah. And if they see a metal tool, like in the shot, some lawyer somewhere is going to say, ah, you were using that metal tool. You put marks and tool marks in that lock and you know, blah. So keep all that out of the shot. It's one of the reasons that our little lipstick tool, again, all plastic. If you want to use this for deconstructing things, we can get our tail cap off of here. Not too many of you are doing professional forensic work, but people do say they find it interesting at times. Okay, so we've got that off. Now, you might say, okay, so if you, do you need like a plug follower? Yes, you do. So let's go ahead and get an acrylic plug follower. So how do you get the plug turning and free? Do you, do you rip the top cap off? You, you could do that. Uh, it's a little messy in my opinion. What I'd much prefer to do is of course, you know, get the lock, get the plug turned and eject it out with a follower. But sticking tools in there, what if this was an actual investigation? What if we wanted to know had this lock been picked? Well, you're not sticking picks in there to do that. So the one thing you're allowed to do, and it's very common to do, you can, you can peel the top off, you can do cutting and slicing of the cylinder in a way that tries to not damage the key elements within the lock that would be typically subject to inspection, or the use of a blank and rear shimming. Uh, this is something we've covered in class plenty of times. But if you've never seen rear shimming actually performed as a tactic, 
Let's go ahead and look at that. Yes, I know I've got metal in the shot. Sorry. Sorry, opposing attorney counselors. Let's get a, uh, you know, an actual cylinder shim out of here, out of our little lipstick container. And some people don't quite grasp how this process is supposed to work. Uh, I sometimes will, you know, use our, our lipstick shim holders, like you can see. You can kind of pop this guy up here, get that in, and cinch it back. If you have, uh, you know, really unsteady hands, this is a nice way to kind of hang on to it. I'll try to use this. I usually just use my, my bare hands, but yeah, this is just so weird to me. I'm much steadier doing it the way I've, I've always historically done it. You've got a cylinder shim here, right? So coming in the back, I can't get very far. You can actually see I can get about this far into the lock and then I'm stuck, right? I got, I'm hitting something. What am I hitting? I'm hitting the, the chamber right here. I'm hitting this pin stack, which already I know this customer uh, did not understand. They did not check this lock because there's got to be six pins in this, right? So I'm hitting this. Well, how do I get past it? Well, imagine how the front of your keyblade looks. We've got that sort of ramp, right? So as I pull this out slowly, I'm going to extract the blank. That pin stack in that chamber is going to start dropping down. And hopefully I can catch it right at the shear line and gently get my shim through to the next position. Let me try to get everything out of the shot here. What I try to do is I, I will often almost just sort of squeeze like this and roll so I can kind of, kind of, kind of give, her a little, give her a little of that action. All right, so I just felt it slide in by one. And if you're not you know, familiar with this, you don't believe me, I can even make a little line right there on our shim. So you can see the cylinder shim, that's our first line right there. Now, in a forensic investigation, I probably wouldn't do that. I wouldn't want to smear ink or anything, even something like that, into the lock for no reason. But see, I'm almost giving little taps and, and touches as I'm slowly extracting that blank. There we go. That's the next shear line that's in the next chamber. And I've slid it in a little bit further. I'll keep doing this with the line so you can actually get a, a good visual on this going on like that. Now, it's never a guarantee that each, you know, same position, you're never going to be quite the same depth out with the key. Oop, there we go again. That one ha happened a lot faster. That must have been a much smaller pin. I didn't have to drop the pin nearly as far as I was extracting the key blank. So we're halfway there already. Still on camera, there we go. Man, oh, there we go. That one I had to go a lot further, it felt like. See how much further in we are here? And the main trick is I have to make sure I'm driving straight in. I'm not veering off to one side or the other. Ooh, that one went right quick. So unless I'm mistaken, we'll be there with one more position. And the deeper in you are, the more the, more the drivers are all pushing you know, against your shim. So you get more friction that you're fighting, which is why in the real world, if forensics don't matter, this is effectively a one pin lock at this point. I could just pull the key out and pick it really quickly. But we're trying to stay forensically pure here. Oop, there we go. That feels pretty good. Now I think the shim is all the way in and I could test that sure enough. So don't need this key anymore. And I definitely don't need the shim in my way. You can actually see each step that we, we went right through. That was kind of neat. So we've got our plug turned. Get our follower tool ready to go here. All right. Let's see what these chambers hold. I've seen some people that will come in and actually use this, you know, use this blank to come in and reach 
and we're using our, our plastic formed end tweezers. Uh, not something typically sold in any catalog. I will heat up a small piece of rod stock, just heat it up and squeeze just to, to melt the tip of those tweezers. This is sometimes a little more elegant than the, the dump and shake method. So, looking pretty good so far. Can we eject our pins? Now, again, every locksmith's a little different. Some people like to be right in there, like ready to catch it and gently, you know, ease that pin out. That's one method that's perfectly acceptable. And we've also got a spring in there. Uh, something I honestly do a lot of the time. I'll just pull until I hear a click. Now, why is that a little dangerous in forensics? Well, what if there is mastering? What if there's multi-levels of mastering? And I've just got a pile of multiple pins as I lift it up like a magician revealing the ball and the cup uh, that I wouldn't know which position was which. And all of that matters when it comes down to archiving all the parts. I really do like these, the way these sort of light pipe. That's the reason we use the clear acrylic in class. You can get a much better view of what's going on inside that lock. And of course, if we had a small light source on the table, it would be even more pronounced. If you're ever taking a lock apart, putting it back together, just remember this little line, at least on our cylinders, direct from Kaba Ilko, that is the front. Uh, I've seen people you know, you can see the distance to front pin is very small right there. Hence, right on this lip, I mean, you can see the front chamber is right there. Compared to the rear, look at all that extra space back there. So I've seen people occasionally in class and otherwise get their locks ready to go. They're going to repin re them and they'll put it in backwards. They'll kind of slap it in like this and they'll say, waiting for that click. And they'll say, wait, it's not, it's not clicking. What's happening? What's happening? Well, what's happening is your chambers aren't actually lined up. So the driver pins aren't truly dropping straight down. Uh, now, thank goodness when that happens, most students don't start playing with it this way because then you'll, they'll lock like about here and they'll go, oh crap. Uh, so yeah, you wanna make sure you're putting that in properly. And speaking of putting things in properly, now comes the, the real tedious fun part of forensics, which is archiving all the parts. Uh, sorry to everyone who's sad about all the microplastics in our oceans. It's a very plastic intense process, but this is the reason that we actually created our labels to be this size, uh, because I hated seeing full size forensic bags used for every individual friggin pin. Uh, that is, that is how this would work. So literally I would, you know, say date and time, location, et cetera, et cetera. And then description, right? So what is this key? pin number one and every single part gets its own bag all the way down the line loop so you are allowed now we mentioned you know like peeling back the top cover you in general are allowed to do things that could be considered destructive as long as they don't introduce new evidence so peeling back the top cover of this little strip it's not going to add marks to the pins in a forensic investigation case. And if you wanted to, you could reassemble the lock to, to like test its function. You would just have to put a fresh top cover on because that is not part of the investigation, typically in a, in a case of looking for tool marks and things. So there's a lot of ways to go about it, but one thing you have to do is when it all goes into an evidence bag, all of these little pieces all get individually documented and all get individually cataloged right on down the line.
just to show exactly you know how much this would take for each position so every single situation deals with, and then you know you got all these parts you can't you can't just mash them up together in the evidence locker even though it's unambiguous where they would be in the lock right So then once you've got your pile of little bags, you can put them in another bag. Now it can be, depending again on the, on the investigation, it can be a proper evidence bag, or it can be another bag that you, you have available, as long as that bag is possible to be sealed, safely stores everything. And then even though this isn't you know an official evidence bag, I can go ahead and put a chain of custody form on there should have done that before I put all the crap in it, right? And I can write, you know, who has it, who doesn't have it, when's it in, when's it out. And that would allow anybody in the future to reconstruct the entire lock and forensically examine any piece of it, even though it does make, you know, quite the pile of plastic. It's what we have to do if you have to preserve evidence that is able to be examined uh, by you, by opposition counsel, by somebody later on, by authority figures, you name it. Do it right the first time. Make sure everything is unambiguously separated. Is this, you know, the tail cap spring? Is this the front pin, the back pin, etc.? I think uh, we have established, forensically speaking, that this was in fact a six pin lock. And you know what? Maybe we'll do a, a second part of this video. We'll do a little forensic investigation of one of the pins to see if it was ever subject to any kind of picking, manipulation, if any tools got shoved in there, or if the person who had the lock uh, never really even touched it at all. That'll be part two. In the meantime, I hope this was entertaining. I hope this was educational. I hope that you don't mind the fact that I, you know, wasted a lot of plastic and paper in this process. But it's kind of cute. I'll make this a little demo display for, for our classroom space at Red Team Alliance. Uh, as always, Red Team Alliance is available for any number of training. We're really excited about stuff we've got coming up. All things being added to the calendar. I'll leave a, a Red Team Alliance link here and, and below. I don't know if I have a giveaway this week. You know uh, you know what? I can't give you... T plastic bags are not the most amazing freaking giveaway, right? But um, the pinning trays. You got a little RTA pinning tray. Why not? If you're not familiar, these, these are the, the design that I've evolved over the years with little slots for decoding things like Medico pins. But uh, yeah, that's the giveaway this week. You all know this by now. You sign up, you're good. Get in the drawings. I don't use this mailing list for anything other than really giveaways and the occasional, if I'm stuck in a prison on the, in some other foreign border, maybe I'll send up a flare and get some, get some assist because that's how, you never know, the world's unpredictable. But in the meantime, uh, this will be the win for somebody. I've got all kind of other prizes. I'm a little backlogged on the prizes. It's been a couple of weeks, man. I'm so sorry I didn't get a video out last week either. But you'll get some bonus content. You Maybe a second video this week showing that. And I've got a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm going to showcase, so very busy times. Uh, my eyes are doing a lot better. Thank you so much to everyone who's written about that. I will keep churning stuff out as long as you keep enjoying it, okay? Thanks so much for watching. Stay safe out there.